Jim Tumor's the State of the Art. And following his talk, we have um, two really excellent fellows um, that will be giving us some case presentations and hopefully we can have some good group discussions. I think there are some very interesting cases and uh, look forward to hearing everybody's thoughts on those. So we have Dr. Wes Northam, who's a fellow here at Boston Children's and Dr. Moni um, Bebahani, hopefully I said that right, who's a fellow at Dr. Lurie, at, at Lurie Children's in Chicago. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Ellen Bogan and uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks. It's a real honor to uh, be part of this. Um, and I, I thank Dr. Proctor for reaching out and the entire team at the PEDS section um, to, uh, to do this. This is really a neat idea what you do and going over these cases. So what I want to talk to uh, uh, you about is something that I've been fascinated with all my career, and um, and the question is always, what's the best surgical approach for progression-free survival in a pineal region tumor? And I'll tell you the answer in the first five minutes, so that you can go and eat dinner, or leave this uh, this, uh, and come back when the fellows talk. But um, here are my disclosures. Uh, these are, um, and uh, none of this is pertinent to my talk. Uh, but I do want to say one thing, um, a couple of uh, conflicts, there are no conflicts of interest for this talk. This is not level one data. There are no cohort studies or no, this is really uh, a case control study. There are no really good case control studies on pineals because they're not enough. Anybody who says they do a hundred pineals a year is just lying to you. So um, this is really level two and three evidence, it's retrospective, it's IRB approved. And I have a particular bias because I do both pediatric and adult surgery. Um, I do 50-50 of each. And so half of these are adult cases, half of these are pediatric cases. And really, this all started with a, a chief resident who came to me and said, hey, um, uh, Rich, does the surgical approach determine the extent of resection or the neurologic outcome and progression of free survival. And the answer, and this is the paper was based on, uh, 50 tumors, five years, five year follow-up. The answer is no. So the answer is you could pick whatever approach you like and you will, you will get the, uh, you, you, will, you will be just as efficient and successful in terms of progression free survival. Progression free survival, like every other tumor, is not only dependent on your surgical skill, but it's also dependent uh, upon the pathology mostly. So here's my conclusion. Here's my last slide. I'm going to show, I like showing my last slide first so that in, in the world of Zoom, that everybody can do what they're doing. So, first, treat underlying hydrocephalus. Um, obviously, I'm a big fan of endoscopic third ventriculostomy and biopsy first, especially if it looks like a germinoma but almost for every tumor, I do that. Um, and then surgical resection, and I'm gonna go through the broad surgical uh, repertoire. And then uh, there's no superior approach, okay? And I'm gonna talk about when I use each approach. In adjuvant therapy, I'm a big believer in second look surgery as indicated, okay? In three of the cases that Lisa shared with me, one of the cases that Lisa shared with me um, is, um, is, is one of, uh, of those sorts of things. So more than anything else you do in neurological surgery, for me, from my perspective, is there are three simple principles. Is the case indicated to go? go? Is, is there an indication to do this? And more than any other thing that we do, this is anatomy and geometry. So when you're that deep, when you're 140 millimeters into the brain, it's line of sight, field of vision, working cartilage, trajectory depth, and relationship to arteries, veins, and ventricles. No other area of the brain depends on these things as much. The geometry of what you're going to do when you make a decision of which approach. And then the other thing, and this is not trivial, it's practical considerations. If I have a six foot five, a uh, fellow, then I may be doing sitting cases. When I have a five foot five fellow, I'm, I'm going to be doing it prone or in the concord position. 
So uh, practical considerations make a big difference in what I do. Uh, this is my perspective. So of course, I, I don't need to bore the experts on this, but we're talking about the relevant anatomy. Um, uh, I won't bore you with that, um, but I will say this is a beautiful, this is from Roton, a uh, beautiful area, and there's the pineal gland. I've left out the 30 minutes on the pineal gland and uh, pineal tumors. So, so uh, like rodent, I think in threes. So there are three kinds of tumors that you're going to find in the pineal region. Germ cell derivatives, okay? Um, and then the non-germ cell derivatives, i.e. the malignant transformation of pineal parenchymal cells. The pineal cytoma, the pineal site that turns into a pineal parenchymal tumor. So you have germ cells, you have the malignant transformation of pineal parenchymal cells, and then you got everything else. And what I say everything else is anything surrounding. So astroglia, meninges, ependymoma, choroid plexus tumor, and then adults metastasis. So think in that fashion. Think in threes. I want to say one word about pineal cysts and not to waste people's times. I see about every week, I see one, sometimes two pineal cysts. And I know that several of our very famous colleagues um, do pineal cyst resection. And I just want to say, may, give me one minute on this. And all good people doing this stuff. Um, but I will remind you that this um, is from the people that did all the COVID uh, global burden of disease work. Headaches, to, to do a pineal cyst operation for headaches is, a, um, it, it is probably an unfounded uh, adventure. Um, let's just say it this way. The number one cause of neurologic morbidity in the world in all 200 countries is headaches. Number one, tension headaches. Number two, migraines. Number three, medication-related uh, headaches. So the point of, is that if you operate on everybody with a pineal cyst with a headache, that's 20% of the population, uh, up to 20%. This is a Hopkins paper that shows up to 20% of people have pineal cysts or cysts near the pineal gland. So you'd be doing a lot of operations. Having said that, when it causes hydrocephalus, when it causes transependymal edema, probably indicated. So I do probably one of these a year, okay? Two centimeter pineal cysts with hydrocephalus, all right? And I'm just showing you this because none of these, I mean, pineal cysts are not part of this talk, but I just wanted to say a word about it. All right, one of the really confusing things for me when I started doing pineal region tumor operations a, a few decades ago was the CSF markers really help? Well, I'll tell you the best paper on this subject was from Canada as expected. And it's called, and it was basically, it was several, it was over a decade ago, but it was a survey of central nervous system germ cell tumors, 128 of them. And um, they looked at alpha, the protein beta HCGs. And this is stuff that used to show up in the primary boards exam. Do you remember this? Some of you are old enough to remember this sort of thing. What goes up, what goes down? Well, this is the problem with it, the reason why we took it off the primary board exam, mark, because the markers are somewhat meaningless. And I, I don't want to say completely, if you look at the 120 cases, in the Canadian epidemiologic study, only 7% germinoma have, have, had an elevated beta HCG, only 36% with non-germ cell, germ cell tumors, and alpha feta protein, again, 34% in non-germ cell, germ cell tumors. So my conclusion, and the way, this is just one person, one neurosurgeon saying this, I do get CSF more but I don't make a decision whether I'm going to operate or not operate. I always get a piece of tissue, okay? Because CSF markers are useful for me in help assessing the success of a treatment of a malignant lesion. If you have a non-germ cell, germ cell tumor, 
a very aggressive one that is metastasized to the lungs and you start chemotherapy, you can follow the beta HCG or alpha beta protein to see how successful your treatment is. And one of the reasons this is so confusing, if you look, this is our series right over here. If you look at the series, the, the largest series in the world is the French series done by Raji. They're all different percentages of germ cell tumors and pineal parenchymal tumors. Um, the French study and my study were the ones that are most closely aligned, but the problem is there are different levels of germ cell tumors and there are different levels of non-germ cell tumors, which skew the data also on this. So again, I only use it for tracking the malignant tumors, but I get it in everybody. How about presentations? Well, I was shocked when I looked at my first uh, first group of tumors that really it, it's not shocking that 75% of the tumors present with headaches. But what was shocking is we all quote paranoid syndrome, great French neurologist, but in fact, it's only a small percentage of my patients had paranoid syndrome and I'm including everything combination palsy, lid retraction, and you can see it's a small number of people that present with paranoid syndrome. Um, and um, hold on a second, excuse me. Um, so uh, these are the definitive approaches that I'm going to talk about super cerebellar, posterior antihemispheric, anterior transcoroidal, occipital transtentorial, and combined approaches. So what about the pathology, the tumor histologies in um, uh, my series? Um, interesting, these are two new ones that the fellows should know about. Papillary tumor, the pineal region, and a pineal parenchymal tumor of intermediate differentiation. Those uh, were categorized in the last um, World Health Organization uh, neuropathology fascicle. Uh, so that's important to know but 20% of my cases were uh, germ cell tumors, pineal cytomas, 10%, and then the rest, you can see everything from chorea uh, plexus or carcinoma to ATRT, all right? So um, one of the things I looked at the KPS scores of both the adults and pediatric patients coming in and hydrocephalus is a good predictor for low KPS scores. Um, 80, over 88% uh, of the patients that come in um, that have hydrocephalus, okay, they present with hydrocephalus and they have a low uh, KPS score. So what, what do I recommend? In 2021, this is a challenging location to operate. It's a potential for devastating complications. There's a diverse pathology. As I said, there are three different groups of tumors. And probably 50% like of all of what we do in all pediatric neurosurgery, 50% of these are curable tumors. So biopsy isn't the only thing that we do as pediatric neurosurgeons. But what was interesting to me as I studied these and I, uh, uh, and I listened to other people's presentations, in America, we talk about endoscopic third ventriculostomy. In Europe, it's stereotactic. So the largest series in the world is Rajiv. He's a brilliant uh, pediatric neurosurgeon in France. And they looked at 370 brain tumors from French centers, pediatric. And all of them go, under, go undergo stereotactic biopsy. They're willing to accept the 1.3% mortality. It's both effective and, it is, um, and it's accurate. Okay, so um, I'm not gonna go over the advantages and disadvantages, but I, I, I'll show you just for humor, for, for giggles, um, novel treatments. So back in the 80s, I started doing endoscopic third ventriculostomies and pineal region biopsies. And um, I use a single, I use a glass rod endoscope. I, my original one was with flexible endoscopes. Um, I only make one hole. I do the endoscopic third ventriculostomy first, and then I do the pineal biopsy. 
This was uh, back in the 80s. I tried to get this published about three times in the 80s and from a very prestigious journal that now publishes our pediatric neurosurgery journal. This is what a very famous editor said to me. And I talked to him, this is the single most dangerous surgical approach this editor has ever seen. It should be mentioned in the literature only to be condemned for the single minded insanity it brings to the field. That's one of the first papers I've ever gotten reviewed. I thought maybe I should become a truck driver after that. But in fact, we know I, I eventually got it published in a German journal, Minimally Invasive Neurosurgery, which is a good journal. And of course, we all know that that's the way, that's what pediatric neurosurgeons do now. As you know, uh, here's uh, in a case that any one of you probably have done, you can see. Um, I look back first, I tilt the endoscope back first. I do it about two centimeters in front of the coronal suture. I use axiom to get my trajectory. I look back, see what the tumor is. Obviously, I do the ETV. I do a three cook balloon. You can do it. Uh, you do it however you do. I always uh, look at the basal to make sure the prepontine cistern looks good. And then I biopsy um, the lesion. This is a choriplexus carcinoma. As you can, you know, you look at it, you can tell right away. Um, after the about the third biopsy, of course, they bleed profusely. That's when I leave the room and I let the fellow spend the next 20 minutes um, clearing the CSF. All right, so what's safe and standard in, in 2021? So I think in pediatric neurosurgery or adult neurosurgery, regardless of what you are, you need to know the interhemispheric, the transtentorial, and the infratentorial supracerebellar approach. We're all familiar with the supracerebellar approach. Um, ben Stein repopularized it back in the 60s and 70s, one of the great uh, neurosurgeon uh, from Columbia. Here are the basal veins of Rosenthal. Uh, you saw I took the, pre, uh, pre, uh, the precerebellar vein first. Um, and in the sitting position, remember the um, the great vein of Galen sits down a little low, so you want to cheat on the uh, brainstem side. And um, once I get in there, I either put, uh, I still use curved mirrors to get around the corners or put an endoscope in there. So uh, it, it is a very popularized approach. It's an excellent approach. This is what it looks like at the end. Um, I, I just remind people when you do the super cerebellar approach, there are a couple of things to remember. The depth, the pineal tumor depth is 140 millimeters when you do it in the sitting position. So you, you have to angle your scope appropriately if you're not doing it in the prone or the concord position. And I use my pituitary tumor. So I do endoscopic pituitaries. So I use the endoscopic, uh, um, I use either the endoscopic or the super long uh, pituitary uh, uh, instruments. Again, sitting, sitting, semi-sitting uh, or uh, prone position, okay? What are the advantages? It's great for tumors located in the midline. It's great for people that you wanna do in the sitting position. You wanna, you really wanna take tumors uh, that are sitting behind the tectum, okay? That are tipping back into the cerebellum, okay? This is one you would not do. If you have a very steep temporium, if you are, if it's in front of the tectum and really a posterior third, not a good approach. Okay, here if you have a wide open uh, approach, here's one. Here's an adult, huge, huge pineal region meningioma. Okay, above and below the tent, but had an enormous corridor being opened up between the posterior third and the cerebellum. You could do that super cerebellar, and I showed this 50 year old person. It was done by my pediatric, one of my pediatric neurosurgery fellows with me, and I brought him over to Harborview, and um, we could see all the way into the lateral ventricles. 
uh, but most of the time that's not the case. So um, this is what the post-op looks like. Most of the time, that is the sort of case that I would have done occipital train, trains tentorial. When you're above, when you have a tumor above and below the tentorium, probably the best approach is the occipital trans tentorium, tentorial uh, uh, approach. The only problem, it's, it's a little disorienting for the residents if you're taking a resident through it because it's an angled approach. You're coming in a 270 degree angle, you're cutting the tentorium, and um, because we're short of time, I'm gonna move through this quickly. This is a 40 year old lady who uh, uh, has a huge, uh, uh, huge tentorial tumor, okay, in the pineal region. And I'm gonna just get to the area. This is um, one of the important skills to learn is cutting the tentorium. And so I have used everything from curved bipolars, okay, to a bogey, uh, because the tentorium, especially if the BNC artery feeds, it can be very vascular. But once you cut the tentorium, you can see into the posterior fossa, as well as the, not only are you seeing this super cerebellar region, uh, uh, the, the super tentorial region, you're seeing into the, uh, you're seeing into the posterior fossa. Now, what happens if a pineal region tumor spills into the anterior third ventricle or laterally into the thalamus as these tumors do? This is where I think the anterior interhemispheric or transcortical choroidal fissure approach is the best, okay? This sort of tumor, as you see, a tumor that's in the pineal, a pineal cytoma that extends forward and instead of growing backwards behind the tectum, it's growing anterior, okay? Those are, are ones, well, uh, this is an example of one. This is where going in and doing a choroidal fissure split, you can fit, you can split the choroidal fissure from the frame in the Monroe all the way back to the curls, all the way back uh, to the ambient sister. okay? Here's again, another pre-op of a pineal region tumor that's sitting in the pineal region, but extending forward into the posterior third. They're really posterior third um, tumors. And so again, to show you, here's the foramen of Monroe. And then when you split, leaving the thalmostriate, and I split on the tinea fornic side, okay? Not the tinea thalmic side. You can see from uh, foramen of Monroe, all the way back to the ambient cistern, all the way back to the vein again. So, and this is with the tumor taken out. The other approach that I used about 10 or 12 times um, in the last five years is the posterior interhemispheric transplenial approach. Going through the spleen, when a tumor is sitting right under the internal, cere internal cerebral veins and it's sticky, you are worried that it is sticking to the internal cerebral veins. And I'll show you such a case. I like going transplenial. Transplenial is a comfortable way. You just have to be able to work. Uh, you have to be able to work uh, um, comfortably. And one thing I like about it, it's a much more comfortable operation than a sitting operation. I do it prone. Um, I do a posterior craniotomy and there are very few bridging veins uh, in, in the sagittal sinus there. And I cut the spleen, here's a vein to galen, I cut the splenium and I go down and work between the internal cerebral veins when they're split, sometimes they're grouped together. Uh, but when tumors are sticky to the veins, um, this is a very good approach. Um, you can remove third ventricular tumors, the lamic tumors, Pine, all pineal, all from the pineal, from the vein of Galen on forward. Um, you just have to be comfortable working through uh, the veins. This is an example. Here's an example, uh, a, a case that I helped Amy Lee with, a 10-year-old girl with an ATRT. So she came in, she had a biopsy, she had an ETV, and 
beautiful ETV and a biopsy. The pathology results were ATR key. Okay. So what's the what's the answer? So she got uh, she got proton beam, but she she had uh, markers that went up again. And so she needed a radical excision of this tumor. Now, of course, I said very few cases have bridging veins. Of course, I picked a case that did have a bridging vein. And for sake of time, this is, and I, I do a lot of my operating with an arachnoid knife uh, as well, um, pushing the internal cerebral veins over, okay? just for sake of time. And the rest of that tumor came out and she is now five years out tumor free, ATRT, which is a little surprising. Of course, she got pre-treated with chemo and proton beam and she's in uh, pretty good shape and she's actually in perfect shape. Um, uh, but a great approach because you're able to work through the vellum and deposit them and keep the veins you're seeing into the third ventricle. And, um, and you're able to keep the veins pristine. The brain looks very calm um, and uh, looks like it's in great shape in both internal cerebral veins. So, Phil, you can take out big tumors, huge tumors that, are, again, you, you've splayed the internal cerebral veins. Um, Small tumors and big tumors, both easily treated. This is obviously a teratoma. Posterior to hemispheric approach. Here's the vellum interpositum, as you see. One retractor, or you can do it without retraction, um, and work between the internal cerebral veins. In this particular case, I don't take, uh, the only vein I feel comfortable taking are bridging cerebellar veins, the pre-cerebellar vein. But in this particular case, I never found the contralateral internal cerebral vein. So I went out and told the family after I took out this teratoma, I think I killed your kid. And the kid was waving on the way out and was perfect. I don't recommend ever taking an internal cerebral vein, but sometimes um, this is the risk of that operation and the child did, did great. So here, let me just sum up in the last two minutes, I wanna sum up the outcomes and, and, and support my conclusions based on this level two data, okay? What are the complications? I tell every family that I operate that I'm doing a pineal region tumor on, expect a 20% complication rate. I'm sorry, I don't care how good you are, even with an ETV uh, or a stereotactic biopsy, you're going to get a complication on this. It's a CSF leak, the ETV doesn't work, whatever. Um, I've gotten out of, out of those 13 that didn't, that was their final operation. There is that complication. Super cerebellar, infratentorial, all small things, a new upward gaze palsy, uh, um, a new sixth nerve palsy. Posterior into him is trans, transplenial. I've only had one out of 13 cognitive deficits by cutting the splenium. And my mistake was a very, um, a very stupid mistake. Somebody tried to go anterior, cut the corpus callosum, didn't get the tumor. So I went posterior and I did a total disconnection. Stupid idea. But um, again, uh, anterior transcoroidal, one out of four new upward gaze palsy, occipital transtentorial. This woman that I showed you that I had took this very large meningioma in the pineal region out, um, she had a new fourth nerve palsy. And as you know, walking downstairs, you need your fourth nerve. She was very upset about it, even though she was cured of her tumor. So what about the, the, the radical subtotal resection or gross total resection rates? They're all pretty much the same. Whether you do super cerebellar infratentorial, posterior into hemispheric, occipital trans tentorial in my series, almost all of them had the same, all over 50% gross total resection rate. 
and here's the p-value. So in summary, um, I use the super cerebellar tentorial approach when um, the plane of the tentorium is reasonable and the tumor's mostly behind the tentorium, okay? I don't use it when there's a steep angle to the tentorium. For occipital trans tentorial, I use it for big, I've used it for very small tumors, but I mostly use it for very large tumors that extend above and below the tentorium. And ones where I'm gonna to need to cut the tentorium to see uh, in, into the, uh, near the brainstem. Anterior transcoroidal, I love this approach. Splitting the, uh, I mean, it's uh, something I think every pediatric neurosurgeon should learn is splitting um, the fissure the choroidal fissure, you can split it uh, from the foramen all the way uh, back to the, uh, to the vein of galen. And the posterior to hemispheric approach, great approach if you're dealing with really tough tumors that you're worried is re are really stuck in the vellum interpositum to the internal cerebral veins and you don't want to pull from behind or you don't, you want to see those internal cerebral veins and work around them as I did with that ATRT. And of course, I believe ETV and biopsy for everybody to start off with, or most patients to start off with. So my last slide is my first slide again, treat underlying hydrocephalus with an ETV if you can, and a biopsy, you can do it through one burr hole. If you use the calculation, you stay two centimeters in front of the coronal suture, you'll get a good enough angle, unless there are thalamic adhesions. Uh, surgical resection, think about um, uh, uh, there's no superior approach. No one approach is better than the other. Really, the progression-free survival is totally based on the pathology, okay? And the adjuvant therapy is indicated or second look surgery, which I'm, uh, I'm a fan of. Certainly, I, I don't hope to do that. But when markers go up in people that have positive markers with malignant tumors. So thank you, Pete Section. I appreciate you. I'm sorry that I rushed through it. I had too many slides, but I thank you for listening. And I, um, I hope this was helpful in any way. If there are any questions, please, please uh, let me know. Thanks, Dr. Ellen Mogan. That was really great. Always um, really great to hear you talk about pineal tumors and some really amazing cases. Uh, so we will get right into our case discussion um, unless anybody wants to unmute with a question for Dr. Ellen Bogan right now. And then as we go through these cases, our fellows will ask um, some questions, but it's an open discussion. So feel free to speak up or you can put a question or comment in the chat. And, um, Go from there. So Dr. Northam, I think you are next. And Dr. Ellen Bogan, we probably need you to unshare your screen. Yep, I'm, I'm, I'm unsharing. All right, can you hear me okay? Hear you perfectly, Dr. Northam. Thank you. My name is Wes Northam, fellow at Boston Children's, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to speak. And I'll be presenting uh, two cases tonight. Um, the first case, if I can get my slides to work. Uh, the first case here is a 15-year-old female. Um, this is a girl who presented after she sustained a concussion. And she was actually thrown off of a horse. Before this event, she had a completely unremarkable past medical history. Um, and she was asymptomatic prior to this concussion. She did have cranial imaging that was done as a result of, of that trauma. Um, and this imaging revealed a pineal lesion. You can see here on this post-contrast image was between a one and two centimeter enhancing pineal mass. On the coronal views here, you can also appreciate the ventricular caliber and the fact that this patient did not present with hydrocephalus. And, you know, Putting this together, this girl was completely asymptomatic, had no significant past medical history, did not present with hydrocephalus, um, and was at this point recovering well from her concussion. Um, and before we get into the uh, management that we performed in uh, this case, I wanted to just pose a question to the group of, of how, uh, how the group would manage this case starting at this point. 
why not just watch it? So I think I think that's always an uh, important consideration, um, Dr. Ellen Bogan. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to put that on on the list as well, uh, as, as certainly a viable option to to consider uh, when talking to the family. I don't think it's a candidate for endoscopic biopsy for sure, and um, and the patient could get blood markers, um, but uh, boy. I, I, I'm I'm a big I'm a big proponent of what, like pineal cysts. Uh, the, this is a beautiful case to take conservative therapy, and the question is, when would you re-image the patient? Three months. So it, it depends on how neurotic you just made the patient when you told showed them this MRI. That's and 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 how neurotic the parents are. Thank you. Um, I will say that the serum markers were negative in this patient, um, and I'll I'll continue a little bit with with how this patient was managed. Um, we were able to perform a biopsy with flexible endoscope, um, the three point seven millimeter endoscope. Uh, this is a picture of the lesion itself on the screen, um, and we're able to get uh, uh, viable pathology tissue, which was resulted as um, a pineal preeclampsial tumor of intermediate differentiation, which one of the lesions that Dr. Elbogen just mentioned in his talk. Um, the CSF was also able to be sampled at this time uh, and was negative. And I wanted to just briefly uh, touch on this pathology as a result of, especially what Dr. Elbogen said, uh, something that I had to review uh, as a result of this presentation. Um, you can see three columns here on this chart, which I thought was helpful uh, to organizing uh, these pathologies. The germ cell tumors in the left, far left column, um, which includes germinoma as well as non-germinomous germ cell tumor. Uh, and then you can see pineal parenchymal tumors composing a smaller subgroup in the middle column. And then on the far right column, far less commonly, some other pathologies uh, of, of which ATRT is one. Um, and then you can see in the red box uh, with these pineal preeclampsial tumors is the pineal preeclampsial tumor of intermediate differentiation, which was what the pathologist um, had called this, this lesion based on the endoscopic biopsy. Um, this is a pathology which was classified, as Dr. Elbogen just said, recently in, in 2000 by WHO as an intermediate between the WHO grade one um, you can see pineocytoma here with the green flag and pineoblastoma grade four lesion. And so this is an intermediate pathology between those two. Um, and there are varied reports. This is a very rare pathology with less than 1% of CNS tumors. Um, mean overall survival it, it varies depending on series up to 7.8 years in one of the large series, and that's after radiation and chemotherapy. However, uh, the point must be made that the use of radiotherapy and chemotherapy in these patients is controversial and variable. Um, for radiotherapy, that can range from none at all uh, in some uh, treatment algorithms to full craniospinal irradiation, which would be done, for instance, in a grade four pineoblastoma. And similarly, the use of chemotherapy is also debated. Um, there's no standard regimen, but several regimens have been um, suggested in the literature. Of note, I highlighted that leptomeningeal dissemination is well reported with this pathology during disease progression. Uh, and there is some promise with newer molecular agents, especially with EGF receptor. And so that being the case at this point uh, with this biopsy result, um, with this would this change anyone's management considerations or how would how would the group uh, propose to manage it at this point? I'd be happy to I'd be happy to talk further. I just wanted to put that out in a <laughs> Anyway, no, I, would, would anyone not take this out, I guess, is, is a good question. I, well, I, I will tell you, so um, Lisa, I, I think this is a very aggressive lesion. 
Um, I'm, I applaud you for doing the endoscopic, flexible endoscopic biopsy. I, I, was, I, I would have perhaps watched it and then done a stereo biopsy, but I, maybe I didn't look at the ventricles and it was, uh, it was amenable to what you did very easily. You did a beautiful job. But this is not a benign lesion, okay? This is the deal. I have five of these. And two went on to become very malignant, um, even after I did a radical resection, okay? So I do think that it is a very reasonable thing to operate on this, in, in my experience. I, I just don't think these are ben as benign lesions. And that was the point of that Journal of Neurosurgery article that, I, that you referred to, you did a beautiful job, by the way, Wes. Of your, the, you really, um, this has exactly been my experience with this lesion. It, this is a treacherous lesion um, that it's like an iceberg. Everybody thinks, oh, that's PPID doesn't sound too bad, but it, is, but it can become very malignant. So with that in mind, this patient did go into surgery. Um, she had her biopsy after she recovered uh, from her concussion. Um, and then as soon as this pathology resulted and after a discussion with the family took place, uh, elected to go to surgery. Um, she underwent an occipital transtentorial approach. Um, you can see the post-operative images here. The patient did very well, um, had a gross total resection, did not have any neurologic deficits in the post-operative period. However, interestingly, the pathology from this resection resulted in a DICER-1 mutation, um, which actually changed the diagnosis to pineoblastoma, which was a great, a great floral lesion that, uh, that we showed on the previous chart. Um, and that, of course, changes the calculus. Uh, and the patient underwent um, a 23.4 gray craniospinal irradiation with uh, pineal boost, as well as uh, chemotherapy regimen, which is listed here um, as is the standard treatment uh, protocol for pineoblastoma. Thankfully, the patient's currently doing well without recurrence on her scans. Um, but this was uh, an interesting case for several reasons. I think one of which is the difference in uh, pathologic diagnosis after the resection was performed. Um, I cited an article down here uh, at the bottom of this slide uh, which discusses the relationship between DICER-1 and pineoblastoma. Um, I think one, one point of discussion uh, that's important, I think, is you know, when you have a very small volume tissue biopsy that may influence the uh, sampling result that, that you're able to achieve for, for a tumor and can change uh, potentially the diagnosis. So I'd like to bring this uh, up to the discussion if anyone has any um, salient points or, or questions. Yeah, I think we expect sampling error more with the germ cell tumors um, and, and worry that we could mix, mi miss a mixed tumor. Not something I would expect as much with the pineal parenchymal tumors, but was the case in, in this patient. Although endoscopic biopsy is an endoscopic biopsy. So, you know, I mean, it's a small volume biopsy. So, um, but I don't, I mean, I think all the right moves great management. All right, well, we are running, gonna run short on time. So Wes, very quickly go through this case and um, maybe in five, six minutes so we can save time for our third case. Sounds uh, good. Um, this second case uh, is a 14 year old male presented after he was hit by a lacrosse stick to his right hip. He was doing okay with respect to his injury uh, from his lacrosse injury, but he developed some coordination difficulty that he and his parents noticed. He had a little bit of left hand weakness uh, and tremor and was increasingly lethargic. Um, he did not have any frank headache or vision concern, but he was clearly unable to perform uh, what the level he was able to perform at previously. He couldn't shoot the basketball. That was very unusual for him. Um, in the emergency department, when he presented, he was alert, did have some mild up gaze limitation. You could see a very large heterogeneous con uh, contrast enhancing lesion um, centered in the posterior third ventricle um, with significant lateral extension. You can also see on this axial image 
he did have some transependymal uh, signal as well, indicating um, hydrocephalus, which was his, one of his presenting uh, symptoms at the time. And I, I put these coronal images up here just to appreciate the lateral extent of this lesion as well. Um, this patient had some additional workup, which included an MRI spine with negative serum markers, which were equivocal with a slightly elevated AFP. Um, and so um, to bring up uh, the question, if, uh, if anyone would um, biopsy or resect this lesion based on this imaging. I'll, in the interest of time, keep, keep moving. Um, this patient did undergo uh, an ETV to treat the hydrocephalus, um, and as well as a biopsy. This was performed with a rigid endoscope. Um, the frozen specimen was uh, revealing small round blue cells and also showed um, tissue consistent with teratoma. The CSF was negative, and the final pathology from this case was non-germinominous germ cell tumor. As well, uh, you can see at the bottom of this slide, a CT, uh, screening CT was done that did not show any evidence of metastasis. For this patient, chemotherapy was induced based on that pathologic result. Um, and then at this point in time, two months out after this uh, biopsy, the patient's symptoms have improved markedly. He's playing sports again, um, does have some mild left upper extremity weakness, but that has improved as well. And interestingly, his serum marker that was mildly elevated, the AFP has now come back to normal range. I'll show you a picture of his most current MRI. It shows a similarly sized lesion, but does have some internal blood products and some cystic change, suggesting possibly that the patient is, is responding to the lesion, which would be corroborated by the AFP result. At this point in time, we are planning for full six cycles of chemotherapy um, before likely resection. Um, and it is felt that the tumor is consistent with a non-germinomous germ cell tumor with a component of mature teratoma. Um, but we are still uh, discussing the role for surgery. That's just the tentative plan. And this is the most current um, image. So I want to bring that up to the group as far as if anyone had any, uh, any comments about the current plan or considerations for surgical approach. Well, I think you're gonna eventually uh, need to operate on it. And, uh, you know, again, I, I'm not seeing all the images, but there is a, there are several approaches that would get it, um, including a, trend, a transtentorial approach, an interhemispheric approach, either anterior or posterior. The key is the lateral extent of this. And you can see into the thalamus um, uh, through the choroidal fissure approach, you can see into the thalamus also through a transplanial approach. And of course, it depends on the transtentorial angle you take uh, to do that. Um, but um, I I'd favor one of the more supertentorial approaches, but I think you're going to end up needing to operate on it. Thank you. And I usually, I usually do an angio with the venous phased so I understand where my veins are. Uh, I'm not, uh, I think I see your internal cerebral veins, but I can't see them that clearly. We, we thought they were pushed superiorly uh, by the tumor, but I didn't include uh, a lot of images to illustrate that. Great management. Okay, any other comments before we move forward with um, Moni's third case? All right, so Wes, let's have you unshare. And Good afternoon, guys. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Ellen Logan. That was a fantastic talk. It's always great to hear it. 
Um, uh, I'm Mani Babahani, and I'm the current neurosurgery uh, uh, fellow at uh, Lurie Children's here in Chicago. Um, uh, so our case was a 16-year-old male who presented with uh, with a morning nausea, vomiting, headache for for a long period of time, and some decreased peripheral vision. Uh, the child was otherwise relatively healthy. And uh, I'm going to put up there a CT, which showed marked ventricular megaly, um, some calcification in the pineal region with, um, with the pineal um, mass. And the MRI uh, showed uh, avid uptake here uh, with, with the mass that you could kind of clearly visualize. I'll pause it there so people can kind of appreciate the mass there. Uh, but um, th those were some of our initial imaging of this child that we had. And um, in the interest of time, I'll try to cut out some of the things that Dr. Alan Bogan had so um, eloquently talked about. Um, but the, the um, occurrence of um, intracranial neoplasm in this region is about one to 3%. And these lesions usually uh, originate infratentorially and they expand to the posterior um, third ventricle, similarly to what we had. And, and it's, it's difficult to give this talk without the classic pictures of appreciating exactly where, of where the pathology is and the intricate uh, vasculature involved in, in this region. And additionally, I know this was covered and I'll briefly touch on this uh, and I know Wes covered it, it would be somewhat redundant, but um, the, it, to understand what some of the tumors are is to understand the actual normal pathology in the pineal region and some of the normal cells that, that, um, that will then go on to become malignant. Um, so pineal site, neuroglial tissues, um, and the classic kind of calcification that we often see can be appreciated in the right lower hand side. Um, so these these can give up give rise to to a lot of these ger germ cell tumors and and we often try to distinguish somewhat based on imaging what we're dealing with, um, which I, I would say that we come up short that there's no definitive way of looking at an image preoperatively or at presentation and be able to distinguish what a child or a patient has. Um, and uh, this was a recent publication and I and I think. Uh, um, West went over it. So in the interest of time, how our patient presented, uh, likely symptoms related to increased ICP from obstructive hydrocephalus, but patients can also present with symptoms from direct com compression of the brainstem or the cerebellum. They can present with endocrine dysfunction. So there can be a variety of presentations that, um, that are related to focal mass effect, um, hormonal changes. Um, and the, the classic diagnostic workup, which um, we, we went over, and we still utilize, although um, we always aim to have a, a confirmatory test, um, is, is our markers that we have available to us. Um, um, in, this, in, this, um, in this case, we, um, and I'll go over some of the markers that are classically used, like the beta ACG and AFP, uh, PLAP we often talk about, and, and as, uh, as it was earlier referenced, it's often on, on most of our uh, examinations, but um, it's not one that's readily available, and it's not one that particularly we hang our hat on in our institution necessarily. Uh, CD30, CD117, um, and then the latter three are mainly histopathological um, um, markers uh, that kind of help distinguish, but again, those are not biomarkers. Um, you need tissue uh, for diagnostic purposes. And looking at the recent literature, um, it, it would be great to have more specific um, CSF biomarkers. And, and there are a lot of work being done uh, looking at the C CSF ctDNA kind of at the, as a um, liquid biopsy um, concept. And the milieu of the CSF is certainly changed by presence of um, a germinoma, but nothing definitive that can be uh, translated yet to uh, a widespread clinical practice. Um, and there's a lot of work being done or some work being done in this area, but, but nothing again that is really manifested into a change in clinical um, practice. So going back to our case, um, this child presented with frank hydrocephalus and uh, we place an EVD to temporize the child uh, and, and we send AFB, beta ATG, ALKFOS. And again, um, knowing that we had plans for a biopsy, um, although these markers were negative, uh, we, uh, we proceeded with, with kind of an ATV and a tumor biopsy. We, we had um, pretty good hope given the age, given the ATV success score that it would, um, it would help with the child's um, 
hydrocephalus. Um, and uh, we performed our ETB and then our biopsy and using a fl flexible endoscopy in this case, um, kind of allowing us more versatility with planning our, our, um, our hole versus that of a rigid, um, rigid endoscopy uh, and biopsy. And the intraoperative um, specimen for us was a germinoma. Um, and, and at that point, uh, we, we opted for you no know, further resection and uh, um, um, I'm just going to briefly touch on some of the things that uh, come up on germinomas often. Again, the age of the patient, the gender of the patient, were both very reflective or pointing towards germinoma, uh, often seen uh, in, in men. Um, the CT, um, there's discussions about the pattern of calcification although a trend and not necessarily one for, for us to ha hang our hat on as, as a diagnostic criteria. Um, in the MRI, some uh, T1 and T2 characteristic um, presentations that, uh, that I've uh, put up here, but again, very nonspecific. You can have DWI restriction, um, can have GRE signal changes. If it's a bifocal um, presentation, on imaging, it certainly makes you think more germinoma. However, um, however, not not um, again definitive. And then subependymal extension in this case uh, would make you think more uh, that of a germinoma. And uh, the histopathology can be appreciated up. So in management of these pineal region tumors, um, you know we we in a way followed the algorithm. Um, pineal region tumor, we saw that on imaging, patient has hydrocephalus. Um, we opted for a uh, temporizing measure and, and then an ETV. Our markers were negative, we, we performed a biopsy. And um, the question becomes um, treatment um, and, and utility of, of um, some of the um, current um, trials that are going on and, and the known treatment of um, germinomas being, um, being displayed on the screen. Um, I guess how many, um, how, how many people in the audience would, would opt for pursuing um, clinical trials or have had an experience that is, um, had a better yield than uh, what the current uh, treatment paradigm prov provides? I mean, if someone has any comment on that. But in, in essence, the treatment for germinomas is, uh, is that of radiation and the concept of trying to incorporate more chemotherapy and a lot of what drives the studies is more chemotherapy, less radiation to reduce the long-term effects of radiation in, in um, younger age patients. Um, so it's not that radiation would not take care of this, it's it takes care of uh, these germinomas beautifully. However, solely relying on radiation, higher dose radiation um, is, is what drives um, the field into trying to dabble into different um, paradigms of, um, of medications and combination of medications, timing of medications, uh, in essence, to really cut back on the dosage uh, of radiation administered and, and reliance more, more on the chemotherapy agents. Our patient in this case was enrolled in a phase two trial, the ACNS um, uh, trial that's going on and, and they seem to be showing um, promising results, um, although um, he has not yet completed his full course of treatment. So um, we will we'll continue to follow him um, and, um, and see how he does. Um, and, and that's uh, some of the kind of um, discussion points in this would would uh, be different different types of biopsies that, that we may have um, some attempt flexible uh, endoscope, some attempt uh, rigid endoscope, um, reliance on tumor markers versus biopsy, which I think Dr. Allen Bogan definitively answered that question. So um, if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll be happy to answer. You know, I think the biggest controversy right now is the delivery of the radiation. You're using lower dose radiation to the, the, the ventricles with a boost to, to the primary site and using a toposide and other and cisplatinum. Um, I think it's going to be a multimodal sort of approach when you get tumor 
cure rates of 85, 90%. And of course, you know that molecular markers, even though the alpha feeder protein beta HCG don't necessarily go up, there are gonna be certain ones that uh, um, uh, are well treated with that. And then there are gonna be certain ones with subpopulations of germ cells. This more surprising one is when you go back and find out that it's not a pure germ at all. It happens rarely, but it can happen. So I think the, the, the research now will be on how to optimize radiation without causing cognitive deficits and using a balance of chemotherapy with it. Yeah, I've definitely noticed that trend, trend as well. And nearly all of these kids are, are getting some type of adjuvant chemotherapy to minimize their dose and all getting biopsy. So that, that, yeah, thank you, Wes and Moni, for your presentations. I, they were both um, just awesome. So thank you. Um, and for this whole session, thanks, Dr. Ellen Bogan. Um, so I, I think this actually comes up in um, oral board prep, um, you know, these types of lesions with hydrocephalus and, and um, you know, a lot of the take home points um, when, when preparing um, adult and peds uh, candidates are, are um, defining your goals of therapy up front, right, which is, um, uh, what Dr. Ellen Bogan um, emphasized, which is treatment of hydrocephalus um, first, right? So do your ETV first, and then, um, you know, your goal of actually getting a tissue diagnosis. And I thought this was neat that we, um, you know, heard kind of different viewpoints about using the rigid endoscope and the flexible endoscope. And I think our field is really still um, in an evolution. And I think that's really neat to see, um, or stereotactic biopsy. So I, I think, um, you know, those are all kind of dealer's choice, but coming up with a, a rationale and verbalizing it uh, up front when you're dealing with um, oral boards and, and then defining your goals and, and then the goals of surgery if you come back. So. All right. Any other comments before we wrap up the session? All right. Thank you everyone for joining and especially thank you, Dr. Ellen Bogan for great talk and, and comments. So thank, thank you for arranging this, Dr. Barrett and Dr. Proctor. That was great, Dr. Leonard. I really appreciate it. A lot of fun. Thank you. Great job, Wes and Thank you. Peace in.